Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Lifetime Training Podcast. And today I have the one and only Mr. Tom Purvis. And if you don't know Tom, he's been around forever. He was part of the original, original NESM. And then has since, and that's where I got introduced to him. And God, that was like 96. Um, and he scared the shit out of me, to be honest with you. But uh, he's been a longtime friend, mentor, uh, and honestly, someone who is going to question what we all think and not in a way to make you feel bad, get your emotions out of it during this episode and just listen and, and understand that things are always, I always say simple, but not easy. And, and that's the, the, you know, biomechanics, which is his master mind and, and spent his life teaching and discussing. So Tom, you know, again, long winded <laughs> intro, but thank you so much for being on the show. That was a much shorter intro than I would give anybody because, you know, I just, can't get off the uh, the labyrinth of crap my brain goes to. So good job. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, today what I, I want to discuss, I mean, again, simple but not easy is, is the thing that keeps coming to my mind. And so many people want to simplify things and I get it. But we have a we have a expectation and a, and a right and to be able to understand what the hell we're talking about. And today I want to try and keep it a little bit laser focused on a couple of things. And, and we talk about biomechanics and, and we think we learn biomechanics and we, you know, what we learn in the text. And then we get confused sometimes because people out there are teaching what they call functional biomechanics. So I would love for you to start and, and just try to decipher those two things in the beginning. Let's try to define those things. I know you're about definitions and, and making sure that, you know, words are used properly. Yeah, that's a mess, isn't it? Because first of all, I love what you were saying. I think a word that we might throw in there is we have a responsibility. This job is not for us to feel good about ourselves. It's nice when we have an occupation or do something where we can feel satisfied. We can feel like we did somebody some good. But it seems like in this industry, and I'm just going to cover almost all healthcare, not just fitness, that if we show up and if somebody's sweating, we think we did well. And we don't really think long term. I've mentioned to you before, I've got, I have clients that have been in my facility 30 years that I started training. Well, more than that, I started training in 1988. You really don't have experience until you have people who absolutely cannot do what you ask them to do. You don't have experience until you've watched someone go through an evolution of life from 35 years old to 65 years old across the time that you've trained them or are watching them train with one of your close, close, close students or staff. And so... There's a lot to learn from that and, and headed towards biomechanics. I'm just going to say that there's a couple things that people will hate me until they learn that the most important thing they can do is to question everything they do. As soon as we feel overconfident, which is really what this industry seems to be about. Is when we say, oh, this is the way to do it for who I have a client literally halfway to 101, meaning he's 100 years and six months old there's not a single thing on social media that he can do and a lot of trainers will go well that's not who we're talking about why not this person appreciates it way more than the person trying to lose 15 pounds at 35 years old those are different goals being 100 and still walking around and feeling good is or 60 or 50 but anyway yeah, I think questioning, constantly saying, what am I missing is an important part of this. And, and among the things people are missing is this term biomechanics. And I got to tell you, I get it. I took graduate biomechanics and it's the biggest, most worthless thing. Well, in 1983 <laughs> it was the biggest, most worthless thing in the world because we did some cool trigonometry stuff, which I personally enjoy. But at the same time, I'm going, who gives a shit, you know? And when we actually got to practical stuff, Jason, like too many of these things, the, listen, everything is biased by the professor. And most professors that go into biomechanics are biased by sports. So they're sitting there looking at center of mass in a gymnast on the high bar or on the 
parallel bars, uneven parallel. They're looking at all these things and I'm going, what does that have to do with how a shoulder works? And it's specifically how, what's the difference between a fly and a bench press besides the crap I learned about ones for mass and ones for shaping and affecting, you know, the, the distal attachment, all of which is nonsense. But you don't know that you really, if you're smart, you constantly recognize you don't know who to believe. And that is actually empowering. People don't like to question themselves because it's like, oh, no, I feel insecure. It is that insecurity that actually drives people to mastery. And so when you come up with biomechanics, um, I think it's cool to have some formal education in it. I just don't find it that helpful. Now, that's a terrible statement to make, given that I have not seen very many biomechanics professors, most of them were in grade school or junior high when I was taking it, you know. Um, but most of them don't know about exercise. And I'm not saying that to make them mad or their students mad, but I mean exercise globally for the entire continuum of people they might work with. And as much as we, you know, they're, a lot of those guys are biased towards powerlifting or Olympic lifting, all that. And I'm telling you, that's cool for the CrossFit generation, but all those CrossFit people are going to be in my world at some point needing help because they can't do anything because of their backs and their shoulders and all that stuff. That's a reality. And the, you look at the demographic that is, is or should be their priority, if for no reason for making money, who has the most disposable income and the most time to do this and is the most dedicated, it's the people who finally go, holy crap. I want to regain health or keep my health because I see now a different part of life because I'm 40, because I'm 50, whatever. And anything we learn, I'm sorry, but a balance board is not the answer for those people. That is typically too far above what those people need. It is not progression. When we throw out Cirque du Soleil at somebody, because we saw it in Las Vegas and it's cool saying it's, it's not for everybody to climb a pole and stand on top of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, Biomechanics really boils down. Let me, let me show you the simplest thing. People will say things like, exercise is all about movement. And I would say, well, let's think about that. I don't want to dismiss that, but I will immediately, gosh, I would like to say it creates awareness when it really just pisses them off. When I say, do you ever have people do planks? Do you yourself do planks? And they'll be like, sure. And I'm like, and you're moving a lot during a plank or you're trying to avoid moving. Oh, so exercise is all about movement. Wait a minute. We're already hypocritical, aren't we? Because we're just throwing out sound bites and we're not really thinking about what we say. So let me take that a step further and say that exercise is about forces. And the reason the plank is a plank is because you're trying to create a tug of war of forces that is tied Movement occurs when one force wins and one force loses. And if no, if forces are opposing each other and nobody's moving, it's because the forces are the same. I should say the torque is the same, but I don't want to go down that road yet. <laughs> well, I, I got, I, I got to interrupt one second because one of the most profound things I remember it just slapped me in the face when I saw you you, you speak to it. Is you said how well, come... that was me slapping you in the face? Yeah. <laughs> it could have been. It could have been after a Long Island or two or four <laughs> or ten. Uh, but anyway, so you 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 showed and you were speaking and you're like, okay, how come when this muscle and this muscle and the bones in the middle we do this twelve times and it goes back and forth. We call it strength training, but when we do it 2000 times, now we call it cardio. And I just think that that was just like, for me, it just hit me. And that was not that long ago that when I remember you hear, saying that, that it just still slapped me in the face and trying to, to kind of grasp what the heck mechanics is all about. Well, even, and again, you take me down. I'm not, I'm, I'm easy to take down a rabbit hole, but <laughs> even the idea of calling cardio cardio because it's all about the heart when in fact it's it's about skeletal muscle the heart's just its pump servant right so well you're really challenging the skeletal muscle for x number of billions of reps and really what that boils down to is forces on joints very rarely in exercise does a joint get hurt from three sets of 10 with a heavy weight one set of one with a heavy weight you might tear your pec but you rarely tear up a joint <laughs> Cardio is much better at tearing up joints. Yeah. 
Because you do it seven days a week for an hour. Well, I'm exa- who knows, but I'm just saying yeah. it's an overuse type thing. And that's where arthritis comes from. And everybody out there thinks, oh, arthritis is for old people. Arthritis starts with softening of the cartilage in the joint, softening. There's no noise, there's no pain, there's no nothing, but it is happening. And I did an interview with a friend of mine who's the, who was the, uh, gosh, he was on the President's Council for Physical Fitness and Director of Sports Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. And it was like, you know, there can be all kinds of dysfunction without pain. By the time pain shows up or even discomfort, that's, that's going from unknown to a little real estate sign in your front yard. And by the time it's pain, it's a billboard on the highway. <laughs> so you're going to say it's good. Not all of it's good. I mean, just yeah. there's an interesting thing, but yeah. it all boils down to the body's interpretation of mechanics. Yeah. And, and, and the and, goal, right? Like, and, and that's what you were, I think, saying before too. And, and I remember that was one of the first things that I remember you teaching us in the NESM model was first and foremost, what's the goal? And, and it's so funny that, you know, what you were saying with regards to Instagram and people selecting exercises off of Instagram to throw stuff at the person without asking the simple question is what's the goal? <laughs> I've modified that since. And I actually have five questions <clears throat> with the goal only being the second one. Oh, wow. Yeah. The first one, first and foremost is who the heck are you talking about? Because if we say somebody should do an exercise this way and we don't say for whom, we have blown it already because what we're saying is for us. And that is not an exercise professional. Mm-hmm. We are not doing this for us. We're not doing it on us. And if you're only training people like you, you've got a really small demographic to get money from. And they're not the ones that need it typically. Now, again, there are trainers out there 60 years old, but that's an interesting thing. So who, and then what is their goal? Is it body transformation? Because there's a lot of body transformation people out there going, oh, no, no. My students know what the, you know, who they're working with. And I'm like, no, they don't. They don't get what's happening and what's what's liable to happen with some of these people. And, And there's no way to know that. There's no way to predict. But who are we working with and what's the goal? What do they have available? Because we think our job is to increase the range when we don't know if there's bone spurs limiting the range. And that's far more common and does not necessarily produce pain yet. So is that all that we legally, responsibly, and liability-wise have to work with is what the person brings us? What do they have available in terms of range, in terms of motor control, in terms of balance? And the idea of balance is, is on something wobbly. Man, I'm getting ready to do a video on feet. We had a lady come. It was 90 and she had, she walked in like, well, pretty active, actually pretty good, but just a lot of side to side. And it looked like, man, she's teetering. And I started messing around with, she was strong, hips, strong, everything, strong, everything. Took her shoes off and her feet, her toes could not touch the ground. Her feet did not work. And it was orthopedic. They were completely deformed. And if you think you're going to improve balance when someone has diabetes and can't feel their feet, or most of the information comes in about balance, when their feet can't function, not only, I mean, we should be on the floor progressing it and don't even expect much progression. But my point is, who are we working with? What's the goal? Yes. What do they have available? If they don't have feet, it's tough. Do they own their bodies? How many times have you worked with somebody and you said, pull your shoulder blades back? And they're like, what shoulder blades? (laughs) Yeah. You know, so you can't increase their ability with something strength wise. Yeah. You can't use it for 30 minutes of cardio if they don't own it. That's and, and, just and, not and, smart. And on that too, because I think some people could get focused on, well, I don't deal with 90 year old clients and, and why not? But on, on the flip side, you can argue it's the same thing for younger kids who have zero connection and control and understanding. You can take 20, yeah. 20 year olds I mean, that have been yeah, sitting exactly. there on their phone and on a computer since yeah. they were five. They got nothing. Yep. They got nothing. Yep. They are 90 internally. Yep. Right. They are. And I see that every day. And there's no magic protocol for those people. Everybody's like, oh, I took a posture course. Fantastic. And in that posture course, they probably told you the reason why posture is bad. Maybe two reasons. We've got a list of 20 reasons that we talk about in our little, when we talk about posture. Yep. 
And I'm just saying it's, it's far more expansive with the question always asking, what am I missing? And the fifth, by the way, the fifth question of those was, what's their current tolerance? Because if they can't tolerate the pill called exercise that we're offering them, if their body's saying, this is beyond us, they can't make progress. It has to be within a window where progression can occur for someone's given growth hormones or for someone's given ownership, for someone's given, I was out in front of, I won't say the name of the gym because I know you get a, a, a sensitive and <laughs> lifetime doesn't want to be responsible for me mentioning another gym. It was a different right. <laughs> national chain that began with a, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, and they're, they're doing their own version of a boot camp because God forbid that, you know, they do something different. This is an industry of following, not leading. And uh, this girl screaming at a bunch of definitely overweight, I'm just going to say housewife looking women. And I don't know if that's a bad thing to say these days or not. Everybody's so sensitive that the first amendment goes away. But, um, and these people with these monster valgus knees have no business running on the asphalt parking lot in the first place. They're doing sprints and they're 10 or five or whatever into it, but they're obviously failing at control. They never probably had control running. And she's going, Come on, if you can't do this, and we're going to do five more. And I said, did you just hear yourself? If you can't do it, you're going to do more? Let me set you down and show you some calculus. And if you can't do it, I'm going to give you calculus too. <laughs> Come yeah. on, man. I hear you. I hear you. So, so getting back, though, can you, again, try to explain, you know, there's, there's this biomechanics, and then there's people that are saying, biomechanics when the foot hits the ground and things change how oh, it's a bunch of nonsense it's marketing and it's it's actually in my opinion even if someone the person who created that that's that's a trademark phrase by the way i didn't it's know that not, yeah um there are lots of phrases like that when the foot hits the ground everything changes anytime you introduce another force everything changes, changes. or Something has changed. Not everything. The heart doesn't stop beating typically. The brain doesn't stop synapsing. So everything changes is obviously very contextual. Do the forces change when the foot hits the ground? Yes. And how it hits the ground is important. And it, they change in the knee and they change in lots of ways, but it's not magic. And when the foot, forget, hit the ground, when it's already on a foot plate on a, on a machine, when it's on the ground doing lunges, things are not the same as when you walked over there. But that's just the way it is. Everything you do in terms of adding forces and moving is nothing but forces, things change. So we love the sound bites. Well, when the foot hits the ground, everything changes. It's like, well, you say that like you said something, keep going. Well, and so, so in essence, though, what you're saying- I'm not is saying that, that to you, but I'm no, saying- No, 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 I get it. But, but, but what you're saying- I'm going to try to extrapolate it a little bit is to say what we're talking about is the ground reaction forces in how ground reaction forces amongst whatever other forces being applied is coming through the body when the foot hits the ground. And most Which people don't think of it that way. No. And, and I got it. You know, if I was going to play my little biomechanics game, we've, we've used the term ground reaction forces. So that's a normal term, but realize the ground doesn't react to us. <laughs> And forces don't react. Forces are simultaneous. Reaction, by definition, means something happens after something else. So when your foot hits the ground, the forces are instantaneous. So there's really not a reaction. But it's true that we have inputted and how hard your foot hits the ground and what part of your foot hits the ground. And all of that's cool and important. But our industry doesn't know what to do with that. Yep. So how about we stop using, as an industry, these sound bites that make us think we sound smart and just start looking at in each activity we introduce with somebody, what might be going on? Because I got to tell you, if we understood when the foot hits the ground, everything changes, we wouldn't have overweight people on treadmills. We wouldn't have overweight people jogging. We wouldn't have, if we understood that, you know, it, it, that's the kind of thing. And the biggest loser, the biggest losers on the biggest loser were the trainers. Because they had 450 pound people, they crank the treadmill up to 20 miles an hour and have them jump on, you know, and it's like, wow, you're right. When the foot hits the ground, this person crashes and burns is what happens. But, you know, it's the, the problem is there's no way, there's no way 
to use words to explain physics because they're just words. That's why hands-on is everything to my program and hands-on cannot be done online. It can't because physics is experiential. Exercise is experiential. Teaching is experiential. And you and I've talked about that where it's like, holy smoke, you, we, if we learn exercises from social media, so can your clients. So what is left for you to do? You, you got to be phenomenal at counting to 10. Oh, wait, my daughter could do that at one. So what is really our job, right? Well, one thing it could be is the progressive teaching of something. If anybody remembers how they learned to say a sentence, it didn't start with a sentence. It started with an alphabet. And that's the way we should teach exercise. What is this person capable of accomplishing today? Them. Not what do you want from them, but what can they actually accomplish today? What do they have? What do they tolerate? What do they own? And we've always, if we do it right, got tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever the heck yeah. to add to that, assuming it was tolerated. You, you know, know what's, what's powerful in what you just said, too, is because especially in what's happening in, in the industry right now, where so many trainers are going online and, and just throwing programs out there online and, you know, and again, people are doing them on their own, whatever, but there, some people are worried that, you know, I don't do that. I don't want to deal with the technology. I don't like the technology. I just, I'm an in-person trainer and, you know, my gut and, and what I was thinking of is, is, is then you need to do something different. You need to do something different and learn something different. And like you'd said, micro progress and regress and have that experience be something that is so untouchable where anywhere else that they're going to come to you and stay with you. I will say this confidently and I don't care who it pisses off and I will prove them wrong. If they come to me for, for, <laughs> if your clients think they get as good a workout online, then you're a crappy trainer because you weren't doing anything any different in the gym than you're doing online. If they don't see a difference, you have no idea what you're doing. Yep. No idea. Because the things that your eyeballs should be micro observing live cannot possibly be captured in three dimensions from head to toe online. And people can go, no, my clients are fine. And I'm like, just bring, just let me at them for one hour. Just let me at them. I'll show you what you could be charging for. Well, and, and what it boils down to yep. value. Yep. And, and, right. and it's, it's, it's the thing that I, I want to be clear too, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you'll agree with me here is you're not yeah, saying, <laughs> you're not saying that it's online training is bad. All you're saying sure is. But, but what you're, what you're saying is that there's a difference <laughs> yeah. between the experience that somebody should have in person and what you can charge. And if you're doing things the right way, the dollar amount that you can charge, because the problem with our industry is people, once they get full, they, the only way they can make more money is by, you know, going in different directions or, you know, online, whatever, or they're going to start charging more and feeling confident about it. But if that experience isn't changing because they're doing the same old crap, then, then no, it's not. The people that I found that, that in my, all experience is limited. In my limited experience, which is sometimes more vast than other people's limited experience, the trainers that do the absolute best, the most ethical and most responsible and li liability-wise, the best versions of training online are people that they actually spent a lot of time progressively teaching their clients live. Yep. So that the queuing and the other, it's like, they can say, remember, we talked about this, put a little more weight on the outside of your foot over there, because it'll change the way the forces go through your knee. Doesn't that remember how that feels? And they're like, yeah, you're right. That feels better. So it, the queuing is not good. One, two, come on, three. That's not training. Yep. And so, um, in fact, if you've already predicted how many reps someone was going to do, you've blown it already because you're not paying attention to what they can or can't do. And so um, online has become a necessity, a necessary evil, I might even say. But there are some people that can pull it off because of their relationship. And I don't mean their jokes they tell their clients. I mean, because they have considerable experience in what that client appears to need on a given day. Um, so that <clears throat> there's an interesting thing there. But again, my program is entirely about hands-on and for all the preparatory online lecture stuff, Jason, that's just so that my students and I can communicate 
in hands-on at the level that a true professional should communicate. And you know what I mean by that. And everybody that went and got a master's thinks they understand exercise. And I'll give them that they understand what they learned, but they don't understand how to be a trainer and they don't understand how to be a coach. And I don't care what their degree is in. And I prove it every time someone comes to me, as long as they're willing to wipe the slate clean and do the best they can for their clients. That's always the goal and, and say, what, what am I missing? But these people don't even own their own bodies. These people that think they've been great athletes and maybe won trophies and maybe got scholarships and they come and we'll here, let's, let's, we're going to, we're going to all do this stuff. If you come to my, you know, 20 days or whatever it is now, yeah. and everybody does everything and everybody tries to teach everything. And we expose the goal of education is to expose what we don't know and expose what we're not good at. If we're just reinforcing what we can do, that's not education. That's bullshit ego support you know what i mean so it's absolutely amazing how little these people actually own their bodies compared to well most of the clients that i've worked with for a long time are getting pretty good at it some were good from the beginning because our innate abilities are all very different but it's just interesting who's willing to put them subject themselves to that and say hey i want to find out what i don't know and i want to find out the best ways to teach because i really I'm in this for the long haul. And I got to tell you, you know this also, if you're doing decision making based on what each individual client needs, not just every day, but every fraction of every repetition, it does not get boring. And by the way, there is no time to count because you're constantly trying to micro observe, which doesn't mean micro instruct because that's got to be progression. <laughs> You've seen those guys who, who have this like, 35 paragraph dissertation on how to do an exercise and the client's going, what? but do I sit or do I stand? <laughs> you know what I mean? we got to start somewhere, but um, yeah. So micromanage and micro observe are two different things, but that's, I don't know how to, and like I said, it, to me, it's all experiential. And until you're willing to go, let me, let me see, I want to do this for a career. You know, I'm not just, I'm not just doing this to be like the paper boy making money here. Yeah. I want to actually figure out the best way. We have physical therapists that are like with the Houston, we have NBA, guys, all levels of people and the yeah. people that benefit from it, regardless of PhD or what pro team or whatever, it's the people that go, I really want to learn. No matter what I have, it doesn't mean I know everything. It doesn't even mean I know anything. <laughs> and and, and it, maybe it came from you or not, but I've always said from an early on, you know, learning through you and some of the others is the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know and, and be okay with that. <laughs> be okay with that stay within what you know though <laughs> that's the key Just, isn't it really tough because we really inside we want to feel like we know there was a guy last week i think we i think i said this before we actually started recording but he came to me after watching a few videos he's here locally and he'd watch some of this stuff on exercise professional which like i said is just, is nothing but preparation for hands-on with me that's it that's all it's for and he goes, you know what I realized after 21 years of doing this? And then when someone says they've been doing it for 20 years, they're really saying like, oh, yep. you know, and he goes, I realized I don't know anything. And I said, well, now we can do something. Yep. Now we can do something. What? Because it, it, if you just want a piece of paper, that doesn't yep. help anybody. It doesn't even help yep. you. It doesn't. And so that he kind of did the, the intellectual rock bottom yep. and really decided it was about his clients. But it takes a lot. Yeah. It takes a lot for that person to the admit biggest it. And that's, thing. Yeah. Do you want a black belt to call yourself a black belt or you want to be a master in this martial art? And those are yeah. not the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it's just tough. And that's why and people are like, I want to join your organization. Dude, this is not a club. This is just education. And it's not for everybody. Yeah. I used to have marketing people go, you need to water this down for people. And I'm like, so you walk into Ferrari and you tell them they need to make John Deere tractors is what you're saying. <laughs> they need to water it down so everybody can afford one and drive slowly also. Yeah. It's not it, man. It's like, yeah. it's for people that really, really, really want to work towards something for their clients, a level of thought process, not a level of achievement, not a level of yeah. stuff to memorize, not a level of protocols, but solving the problem of this rep or today or whatever for that individual. And if you have these people long enough, yep. they are not just going to keep getting better. They are going to start deteriorating. Like I said, 20, 30 years with someone that started out in their thirties, dude, they're not the same person anymore. Yeah, for sure. And so I can't do the same thing with them. And you know, it's, you're right. People go, I don't have 90 year old clients, but then I have to ask why not? Yeah. They're because 
if you don't have a bunch of 60 year old clients and recognize from the beginning, you can't do a box jump assessment with them. Well, those guys have a whole bunch of disposable income. Yeah. And why aren't you making twice the money with someone who gives a crap and is dedicated to their life and yeah. their health rather than counting reps for someone who wants to do plyometrics? Yeah. Well, and, and it's, you know, you, you, you mentioned it, it's almost unlearning the things that we've learned in school is the hardest part. It's like, you know, even in a movement, it's like unlearning a bad movement pattern that you've done a million times throughout your life. And now it's that much harder to get. That's a great analogy I've never used before, but you know, that idea that it's something somewhat habitual, Mm -hmm. you know, what's interesting people go, people, there's this old nonsense. It takes 5,000 repetitions to undo a habit. It's like, you know how many repetitions it takes one mindful one. Yeah. You're telling me that, listen, you drive a car. Nowadays, there's an awful lot of shifting the gears down here on the console, right? Used to all be up here, right? Yep. In the old days, you had a car that was up here and you go rent a car and it's down here. And I'm, by the way, I'm stealing this analogy from John Bleverneck, who you're remember. Okay. <laughs> oh, John, yes. Thanks for the analogy. <laughs> but I give credit, man. I'm the only I, I think I'm going to do a podcast credit. and I'm going to get you and Bleverneck. I'm going to try and get Guida. I'm going to I'm going to go after just the, the guys from the back in the day and just have a field day on that one. You just brought yeah, we're all going to come in on our walkers and our <laughs> quad canes. But um, but, but he's like, OK, so you get into your rental car and you reach up here to shift the gears out of habit. Right. And you have this rental car for two days, shifting it down here on the console. And you go home and you reach down here for the console after two days. And you didn't do that 5,000 times. But more importantly than that, when you first time said, oh, it's not up here, you reach down there. You mindfully interrupted that habit right then. It took one repetition to interrupt it. And if you get in your car and interrupt that for two days, what is that, maybe 20 times? Then you're, it's changed. So changing movement is this conscious decision. Changing posture is a conscious decision. Changing the way we think, actually from not thinking to thinking, changing the idea that we know something instead of craving to find out what we don't know. It's just a mindful decision. Well, one of the things I want to get into, you've been a huge proponent and I think people miss this um, of machine-based exercise, and the and, I'll, and I'm going to include in there the functional continuum. Would you mind explaining kind of the functional continuum, and then how does from what you've experienced and what you've seen, how does a machine still lead to improved athletic performance? Where there's a lot of people out there saying, "No, it doesn't." Isn't it funny that people say something doesn't do something when they've never used that something? <laughs> And they also expected to do something that wasn't designed to. My stupid hammer cannot turn in this screw no matter what I do with it. It wasn't designed to. So first of all, I want you to to maybe let's play the game. There's a functional continuum that to me is how someone is functioning. It's not about exercise. So I've got a knee that's not doing well. I've got a shoulder that's doing great. I've got posture that's great. I might... It's not even how the person in general is functioning. It's about the, their parts. It is because the idea, you know what integrated means? You may be the only one. Integrated means the sum of the parts. And the idea that integration has nothing to do with the parts is, I don't even know how we came up with that. I think that is the most ludicrous, ignorant thing I've ever heard. That it doesn't matter what your knee is doing and how well your knee is doing it because it's about integration. So what you said is it doesn't matter how my knee is doing even though it's going to determine what happens when I put my knee in the middle of everything else. All I have to do is fuse your knee and then have you go try to do lunges. See what happens. And you're going, that's a dumb example. It's a great example. It should be eye opening. Now there's an exercise continuum that basically says, all right, whatever's going on in you, there's a, there are ways to address it. And here's what I'd like for people to start thinking. The, external performance in in sports how do we measure things externally what's the score how fast how much weight i'm going to flip it around and say there's also an internal performance or an internal function and how well your engine is working with each muscle being an engine 
how well your engine is working determines what you've got to put together in an orchestrated motor sequence of events. One is driving the car skillfully, one is building the car. And in racing, they spend more money building the car than they do hiring drivers. So, it, and, and I gotta tell you, all this functional exercise, we gotta stop thinking of it as anything but teaching movement. Teaching it, not just doing it with any haphazard nonsense. So even the people that are proponents of functional typically aren't doing a great job. They wouldn't know how to get someone who's bigger around than they are tall to, stay, to, to get from a seated position to a standing position, if it's even possible with their center of mass. So what about machines? They're tools. So two things. There are very few decent machines out there. Very few. I don't care how proud someone is of the crap they bought. They're vouching for shit machines doesn't make them good. If I gave you a halfway decent machine, which is about as good as we get nowadays, there's not a trainer out there that would know what to do with it. So how do they know it doesn't do something for this person? If I improve your knee's ability to extend, I get to use that extension in anything I choose to do. And there is no way around that. And anybody with a background in motor learning will confirm that <clears throat> all day long. The problem is this nonsense. Oh, you're sitting on that machine. Well, there's two things. Number one, that machine has a lot of shear. Yeah, and so I was going to get lunge. into that next. So, <laughs> so yeah, so does a lunge. So does a squat. So does a. I'll go down that road all day with you because I can calculate that stuff. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> but that machine doesn't look anything like what we do in real life. So what? That engine doesn't look like a car either. What we're doing is altering the horsepower in the things we're going to need. And let's get off the isolation thing because there's no such thing as isolation. Anybody that goes, oh, you're isolating your hamstrings. No, you're not. It's not possible because your gastroc is a part of that thing. Your popliteus is part of that thing. They're all working together. There's, you can isolate to some degree, to some degree, joint motions. But the isolating, anybody that says you're, that it's dumb to isolate a muscle, doesn't understand isolation, they shouldn't even be talking about it. It's not humanly possible. And the funny thing about doing a leg extension, one of our gurus across the past 30 years says, what's hard about doing a leg extension? You just sit and lift. And it's like, if that's what you think it is, then you don't understand it. What does it take to control a pelvis? While your hamstring length is changing and yes, contracting to help control your knee forces, and it is, depending on how, especially how you do it, it's also pulling on your pelvis. It wants to move your pelvis. What does it take to hold that pelvis relatively still? So you're, saying that, so you're saying that a seated leg extension could be a core exercise? <laughs> Absolutely. If you're doing it right, the problem is if you just move, if you just move because it's all about movement, you're blowing the benefits of this thing. And by the way, not everything is for everybody. Every tool has a specific purpose. But when we don't know, the who, goal, have, own, and tolerate, we don't know when to introduce those things and when to eliminate those things in this giant exercise continuum. And the people that don't recognize this have never worked with the end of the continuum that can't do anything else yet. And I'm going to give you, if you'll allow me, one more example where people are going to go, oh, that has nothing to do with my people. But if they understand analogies, they might get it. <clears throat> I, I, I am all kinds of versions of bipolar, okay? The, the, kind that people, the kind that people are aware of, but I have this bipolar background because while I was competing in bodybuilding, I was going to therapy school, getting out of physical therapy school and working in hospitals with people who couldn't stand up, people who had been in a coma for three months, people who were quadriplegics and for whatever reason now aren't that same degree of quadriplegic. They were just sick for six months and in bed, which means, so here's what the functional world would say. Jason, what's the best exercise for getting someone to walk? Walking. Walking. Yeah. But they couldn't stand. They couldn't stand up. What's the best exercise for standing? Standing. standing yeah. But they can't do it. Now, I don't know very many trainers, coaches, that have had somebody who absolutely 
couldn't do something or this person doesn't recognize it yet. And they don't recognize there are steps in a process of learning to do things and you have to have the engines to drive to make the car move. So how many times was I required to use manual resistance against quadriceps, manual resistance against hip extensors, manual, re why? So they could stand. And by the way, I didn't just have them sit on the edge of the bed and go stand. No, you can do it. Come on. If you can't do it, we're going to do 10 more. Dude, I had to help them. I basically offloaded for what they could currently do. And then over time, I, I didn't have to do that as much for a lot of them. A lot of them never got much better because they ended up there in the hospital and it didn't work out for them. Yep. But my point is, if someone can't do something, we have to find what they can do in order to progress them. And the idea that that is nonsense simply means someone has way too little experience working with people. I, yeah, way and, too little. and I got to share a story that I, that I saw, and I don't want to get into your thoughts on it right now. Just, it would take us down a, a rabbit hole. But, All right. So I'll shut up. Go ahead. Uh, no, but I, I <laughs> had a previous guest. That's a very strong believer and uses uh, the electrical stimulation compacts machine. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. And she, he had uh, a lady who had a stroke 85 said she can never walk again. So he basically was using the compacts, the electrical stim machine on the quads in a seated position just to get them to potentially fire and extend And literally within five weeks of him using the compacts in a seated position, isolated. This lady is now walking at 85 quickly. Now, again, you well, can go deep into it, right? Yeah, but yeah, there's the, some steps between a quad barely extending and walking. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying though, sure yeah. And, and what I was getting at though, is if isolating a muscle to get the engine going, isn't, if people are saying that that doesn't equate to function, then this person should not have been able to do that. When you took it even further down a, a different direction, because electrical stimulation bypasses the brain. The brain is not learning to contract that quad. You're simply going straight to the engine outside of the car, independent of the starter and trying to coax it into working. So we still have a lot to learn, mm -hmm. but to say that that has no value, which I traditionally did 30 years ago, the East end was not what it was today. And more importantly, we didn't really understand what to do with it to understand that it is yet another tool for too many people out there go, Oh, that's the answer. And they'll do it on everybody. Nothing yeah. is for everybody. Yeah. Nothing. Right. But that's a great thing. Cause now this person has to take this engine. That's now working some figure out how to make it work from yeah. up here. And then the skill of walking, the skill of standing. Yeah. Yes. Standing's a skill. And I'm going to say this and it's true. And I'll prove it to anybody that comes here. A leg extension is a skill. You put most trainers, clients on it, and they're just flopping around like catfish out of water that just strapped into a leg extension. And like I said, it's rare to find a good one, almost impossible in terms of forces. Yeah. But, um, and you can ask me about brand names and they change all the time and I can't help you. I've got to look at the individual machine and it might be 40 years old. It's the best one. I don't know. Yeah. But um, it's a big giant process and we just want simple. We're so comfortable with simple. I swear, Jason, that first day client comes in, assessment stuff we do. Let's go back to the old YMCA. You got to do a box step. You got to do a sit and reach. You got to do all this stuff. That half the time we never go back and reassess and doesn't mean anything anyway. And is not even appropriate necessarily. Let's see, how high is the box? Oh, wait, my lady's got arthritis at 40. So should they be on a 12 inch box? I mean, it's just nonsense. But the I swear most of the stuff we do is to make ourselves feel comfortable. So I have something to do the first day when I don't know what else to do. Protocols make us feel comfortable the first day. We don't ever ask if they're right for somebody or not. We can't observe whether they're right for somebody or not. And it's fun to get people who care and take them and go, do you see what happened there? And sometimes they go, uh, no. Or they'll throw out something and I'll go, well, that was a small piece of the puzzle. There's never just one influence. That's another huge mastery thing besides always question yourself first, not the speaker, not the client, question yourself first. But this idea that, oh, I found the problem. 
This is the best. The idea that there's one of anything, that there's one influence in anything that's right or wrong with somebody, the idea that there's one is about as childish as we can yeah. get. It's about as simplistic, to your point. Yeah. And that actually version of simple makes it easier for our ego to carry on because we don't have to know anything. So it's just a mess out there, man. Well, a lot of people trying to do good and a lot of people yeah, not. Yeah. And, and, and again, I think it comes back to, I'd like to think that most people's intent is in the right direction, but their, their dogma, their, their, their beliefs are getting in the way. And, you know, one of the, the strongest pieces, and, and I want to get into where to find your education, if you're ready for it, um, is, you know, but was your, it was about an eight minute piece, I think you did on objectivity right before you get you know, you started getting into the kinetic and kinematic chains and all that stuff. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> and yeah, but that piece was really powerful of really, uh, you know, defining and you had it later in the course, which in, in some way, shapes or form, it probably, in my opinion, should be first uh, to, because of how it can hopefully open your minds and, and not take it personal. Listen, what, what's right today is wrong tomorrow, wrong tomorrow, right today. What you did, six months ago or a year ago, two years ago, is you could probably go, Oh my God, I probably shouldn't have did that. That's okay. That's part of growth. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to continue that learning and, and to move forward. And that's the one thing that, you know, I just can't thank you enough for the influence that you've had on my life. You've, you've, I mean, I've got 15 different times that I can say that you were like, I, I think of Tom Purvis, you know, the, the one that I have to say is when we were in Denver and you took everybody to a movie and I was thinking I was going to see Indiana Jones or something like that. And, and you took us to go see what the bleep do we know? And I just, I was 22 and was probably 25 and was not ready to see that movie. Like I had no idea what the hell that movie was. And it's about quantum physics and a bunch of other stuff, but it, it influenced me so much, but uh, about seven, 10 years later, I was in a hotel room by myself um, and I was living on my own. Uh, my kids were back in Chicago and I was trying to transition to Minnesota and I put the, the video back in and it just slapped me in the face and I got it. And, and then I went down the rabbit hole version and then, you know, I just, and it's just your influence in, in challenge. And some people will take it as, you know, maybe aggressive or take it as, you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, hurt me, but wh whatever. No, it's, it's, he's trying to elevate the industry and he's not talking about the training industry. He's talking about the health, fitness, wellness, whatever you want to call it industry. And that's the challenge. And you've got to be ready for that. And, you know, I can't overemphasize that and, and thank you uh, amongst the other times that we've had, you know, drinking long islands and doing all kinds of fun stuff uh, on that side as well. It's, it's interesting when I show somebody a movie or reference one, people will watch that movie or, Seinfeld or whatever, you know, for the one, for the one joke. And they'll, they typically don't see what I saw. I mean, I really have to say, watch this one part for this because it was usually contextually related to something. I think that yeah. movie was just overall interesting to me. I love the idea that what we see is not necessarily always entirely accurate, that kind of and thing. There's a lot of it. I absolutely don't care about, but there are just yeah. snippets that speak to me at a given point in time. The given point in time is a big thing. You just said that. Yes. But that's really the thing. I, I've realized more and more that what I'm, yeah, I get all uppity about stuff. Someone interpreted it right for once, and it was really just passion. Yep. I really get excited and to a fault uh, too many times. Um, but I have a lot of students that know. I mean, I, I won't really try to help people much that want to do it from afar. When I have people that have traveled from, 50 countries, 50% 50 of the students at my course I have here, which to me is the only place to learn what I teach. Everything else is a stepping stone. 50% yep. um, of our, our students are international. So when someone wants to sit in Florida and not commit, I'm like, well, then I'm really not going to commit to you. I will answer any question. I will stay in the classroom or the gym till midnight, because if you commit to coming to this thing, it, it means that much to you man, let's do this. We got limited yeah. time, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> while I have a lot of people out there that say, man, he's an asshole. I give as much as they give. I commit as much as they commit. So it's, it, it's, you know, I said one time to somebody when I gave them a sarcastic answer, I said, you know, the answer is always proportional to the question, man. <laughs> you got to ask a good question to get a good answer. Yeah. And so, 
Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate what you said. Um, we're all hopefully always evolving and not too stuck on our, you know, high center. Can't get off the yeah. back on the road. Well, and, and but, uh, the thing I want to, I want to end with is, you know, there, there's an infusion, I believe of trainers coming into our industry now. Uh, people wanting to do it, whether it's, you know, COVID and job change or, you know, just health becoming, you know, it was always important, but obviously now <laughs> people think of it slightly more important and to not know people like yourself. Uh, you know, that was one of the reasons why I keep created the podcast was, is people are going to the wrong people to get information about how to become a true professional in, in, in this craft. And, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, you just give an overview of, you know, you've got exercise uh, professional.com uh, or is it personal trainer.com that, that those are kind of synonymous, I believe, but can you go through, you know, what that is? And then obviously all the way through to, you know, your RTS course and kind of give an overview. So people know, and then I'm going to put in the show notes, you know, the links to be able to go there and, you know, we can work out how we want to try to, you know, get people into that, that course as well, if they want to take it. Well, I'm a firm believer that there's no wrong place to go get information. I think the problem is when people stop there because it is, I found it really hard to teach what I want to teach when people don't have a background in the traditional mistakes of this industry. When they don't know what that is, I can't begin to take them away from that. And I find that people that actually start with my program very often never really appreciate what it can transcend someone from in terms of the muck that's out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if you didn't have your decade, whatever history in stuff, you wouldn't go, oh, wow, this is different. And oh, wow, something different is way bigger deal than hmm, this is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, <clears throat> yeah, back in, um, gosh, you mentioned it, um, a handful of us, were brought together by a guy named Dr. Bob Golden back in 89 when he started National Academy of Sports Medicine. And I was there for about 10 years. And, and real quickly, most people don't over. most people don't realize that because most yeah, about people, four of us started it. Yeah. Yeah, way back before you know the the other regime came in. So I, I dude, there sure. were still mullets back then. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I remember my, and it was, the, the cert was phenomenal. Like it was a five day, a week long intensive where you were in classroom and hands-on and you had to test out in the classroom and hands-on. I, I still remember I was at the multiplex in Chicago when I took it in, in, I was shit my pants when I was taking my, uh, my, my hands-on. I remember the smell of you doing that. So I don't appreciate it. But so really the thing was I kept, I had all these questions and I remember the word sheer becoming a big deal. And I was like, I can't, I'm not a soundbite kind of guy. I want to know what that means. I want to know how to calculate it. I want to, it's scary to me. I might suck at this, but I, you know, you can take a class, but I find it far more beneficial to hire tutors and get straight to the question I want answered. <clears throat> so I had multiple engineers give me um, their interpretation based on their background of sheer, all that kind of stuff. And that was, but at the same time I was doing that, remember where this is going, NASM found it to be less financially feasible to do longer, deeper courses because people were perfectly happy with what they then called the basic course. I got my paper. I'm good. Two days, no money, hardly piece of cake. So as they were getting rid of the advanced course where I was just probably two times had taught depth of sheer, they were getting rid of that course. So I was like, all right, I'm starting my own which grew from five days to 20 days, not at one time, but because there are so many things that people are saying out there, but they don't dive into it to see if there's any truth. And if there is truth, when is it true and for whom? You know what I mean? So that's that really became the impetus for everything I've done is it was built on answering the questions, addressing the topics that were the norm at a given time. And what's so funny is, it's actually old now that isolation is bad because people on social media are talking about how do you work this one fiber of the gluteus medius? Oh, you can't. Oh, you can. And they're going to fight each other. Like, I really wish they'd get jobs because they need to shut the fuck up and, and do something with their lives. But you can bleep that out if you want. I don't care. <laughs> but, um, 
the see now you got me going yeah. but this whole thing of why is it why is it one way or the other why don't why can't we see that all these things are pieces of a puzzle and it's never about us and what we think it's about the person standing or sitting in front of you that is it and if anything you've learned helps to solve an issue for them today is that really a bad thing to have learned you know so that's really what this program is about and not just seeing exercise from a more comprehensive and in-depth way that eliminates names. People want to argue over Romanian deadlift and Russian deadlift and Texas deadlift. And I don't know what, I guess one's in cowboy boots and I don't know about the others, except they're all derivatives of specific joint movements in specific sequences with specific loading, with specific intention. And this is how I came up with the exercise equation was look, all of these things are manipulations of a handful of factors, guys, and you don't need to name them. And what's it's even worse now because people are taking short ends of ranges of motion and saying, I invented that. And it's like, what, you invented 30 degrees of shoulder flexion? That means that if I have 160 degrees of shoulder flexion, there's 160 possible degrees that could have different names on it if we're going to go that stupid route. So when we learn the name of exercises, yeah, it's kind of helpful for communication, but it's gotten to where it's not because they don't know what's inside of the exercise and to manipulate it for, for who? For the client. So that's really what we're trying to do here. And not many people are interested in diving in. Someone, one of my instructors a long time ago had this great analogy. What we wanna do in exercise is choose a can of soup and warm it up and we call ourselves chefs. And then you got other people who are a step beyond that and they actually get a recipe and go buy some stuff and follow a recipe. And then you've got Jason's grandmother who just puts some stuff in a bowl and she can taste it and go, oh, it needs one more grain of salt. That kind of person who never had a recipe in their life. That's the kind of trainers I want to build where they don't have preconceived anything, but they have a set of tools that's so vast and an understanding so useful and practical that they can look at a person and go, hey, I don't know, but let's try this and see how you respond, which is the only way we should ever offer an exercise experience. Let's see how you respond. Well, and, and I think too, one of the things is that what you just said there, I want to kind of simplify and extend is when you go through this course <laughs> is you literally, like you mentioned the alphabet, right? And I always say it when, when you have a certain set of tools, you have like A, B, and C that you know, and that's what you've been taught. When you go and, and, and you haven't really been taught the why behind those a b and c's when you go through your course you not only get the alphabet and back like a to z and z back to a and options that you'll be able to figure out on how to use and apply properly with a person you just become limitless in your ability to to apply force and create exercise and you know and that that course again is called the rts is it still rts one two three and then, well, there's, yeah, <clears throat> so there's a, there's, there's a couple versions of it now yeah. for a variety of reasons, which are explained on the website. But yeah. the, to me, the whole thing was always about, if you want to play my game, you've got to come see me and sorry, but because the whole thing is, was birthed out of my mind and my 30 years of screwing up. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I can't teach you what to do. I can kind of show you how I learned to think. And that's all I've got is to show you how I screwed up. Maybe you can bypass that. Maybe you can recognize it if you see the same thing, but I can't begin to tell you what you do. And that's such a mistake to tell you what to do anyway, or how to do it. I need to tell you how to recognize things and how to think. That's Love all it. I got. So yeah, it's RTS123 is the website. <clears throat> and I'm going to do the worst marketing thing ever, which actually works pretty well for us. Most people should not come <laughs> because <clears throat> they will be disappointed if they're still in a protocol mindset and I don't really want people to be disappointed and I don't want them to waste their money. Yeah. The people that get to me, I will demand that they understand the prerequisites, not having watched them like they're watching Mork and Mindy. If anybody remembers that any dumb show, <laughs> but that they, uh, <laughs> I watched someone Robin Williams the other day, oh, maybe think of that. but wow. um, um, yeah, it's about using the information, which we are not good at. We acquire some stuff, but we don't understand it. So that's what the online stuff you, you mentioned, the exerciseprofessional.com. Yeah. That's what that stuff is for. So we can dive into the gym at a crazy level of understanding. 
we can dive into a place. You got your, we're dive, we're diving in on, we're doing surgery by analogy. You already got your surgical skills. Yeah. I don't have to teach you how to wash your hands. I don't have to teach you how to use a scalpel. I don't have to teach you how you're going to kill somebody or not. We're going to dive in, and there's not a single surgery that's ever the same because as soon as they open the skin, nobody is the same. It's funny. I, exactly. I when, when I was training a surgeon a long time ago, uh, he goes, you know, Jason, the, the best surgeon isn't the one who can perform the best surgery he said it's the one who can get out of the mess the quickest and it's just solve the wow. problem <laughs> yeah. and it's not a protocol man <laughs> yeah. it's not it's a malleable protocol because you open yeah. it up and you're like holy crap the liver's on the other side now that's yeah. an extreme example <laughs> yeah. but there's no there is nothing that is exactly the same when they do a joint replacement there's nothing that's exactly the same in general you can have a list of I need to do these things to accomplish this successfully, yeah. but what you find and what you need to do to do those steps. Yeah. Got to give me the person. So again, it, again, Tom, thank you so much, man. I, I could sit here and talk with you for days and days and days and really appreciate it. And uh, you know, those out there that are ready and really want to be called a professional, uh, whether you're a therapist, whether you're a trainer, whether you're just a regular person who really wants to go deep and, and really, hone in your skills. You, you got to go check out, is it personal training.com and exercise professional.com? No, no, no. I, I um, started out with personal training, but then I acquired exercise professional because it's much bigger than personal trainers. It yeah. is therapists and lots of things. And then I yeah. sold all that stuff to another company because I'm like, like I need another company. I just want yeah. a platform for delivery. Let them solve yeah. those problems. Yeah. Well, more recently after them having trouble with COVID and blah, 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 internally, I am working to reacquire all that so we can get it moving again because it's kind of been right. at a standstill for a while. Yeah. Well, what's great is I sold it for a little more of a premium and now because they're stuck, it's like, oh, take it <laughs> off your hands, guys. It's so, like your own little yeah, stock market. <laughs> so, but yeah, so uh, exerciseprofessional.com is, is the prereqs. It's some amazing, amazing content. Um, you know, about how long is that? Do you know the, the total? Well, I'm about two thirds of the way done with my portion and it's about 120 hours. Got it. And then- um, and, the, then and, and there's going to be, you remember Jacques Taylor? Oh yeah. He's working on a, currently a level one version of his stuff. That's about going to be about 24 ish hours. Beautiful. Of course, he'll have more advanced stuff. Yeah. Um, so I've, I'm asking now that I'm kind of back in control, very specific people who I know have evolved across their understanding and lifetime, yeah. um, not just in terms of information and understanding, but in terms of the practical application of it. So yeah. there'll be a lot more in the future. There's, it's far from done, Beautiful. barely scratching the surface at 120 hours of just my stupid right. face. Yep. And then, and then obviously there's the live stuff, which again, you, you can find out more about that on the RTS123 website. So Tom, again, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Uh, you, you, you're the inventor, the, I don't know if it's, I want to say inventor, but just have changed the industry and, and the people that you've been able to influence and the people that have been able to, you know, basically challenge themselves. So thank you so much and uh, really appreciate everything you've done for me personally, as well as the industry. I'm going to throw out one more thing yep. to you personally <clears throat> yep. and anybody else who's been in this scenario. I do have people that <clears throat> 10, 20 years later, more than that, will come and say, wow, you changed my way of thinking. You changed my life. You changed my career. You changed my career path because I was going to get out of training and go to law or something. <clears throat> And I have to tell them, I, I try to say thank you, but that's not where my brain goes because they were sitting in a class of anywhere from 10 to 1500 people. And if they were the ones who got out of it, what they did and nobody else did, was it me or was it them? Because I was speaking to everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm the common denominator against every, with everybody who didn't get it, Jason, mm -hmm. with everybody who thinks it's terrible. So really... The unique variable in this for you was you. Thank I just you. open my mouth and hope somebody <laughs> like you shows up. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I appreciate it, man. And, and thanks again. And I uh, can't wait to uh, connect with you again in person. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate right, the man. opportunity. Have a great day. You too.